Welcome, we're the Macomb County Genealogy Group. You can find MCGG at our blog website, on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and at our YouTube channel. You can contact us at either of the listed emails on this slide. The MCGG Friday group has been meeting for over 47 years and our MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy discussion group has been meeting for 15 years. During this pandemic and during the Mount Clemens Public Library's renovation, we are meeting virtually. MCGG members volunteer their time in a variety of ways to benefit the genealogy community and the Mount Clemens Public Library. This is the MCGG Friday and MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy Combined Virtual Meeting, June 9th, 2021. Our topic tonight, New AI Tools for Organizing Digital Photos, presented by MCGG's Robert McGarry in the Let's Talk Genealogy discussion format. If this is your first time attending a MCGG meeting, welcome. Attend a meeting and you are a member. MCGG has no dues. If you would like to be added to our mailing list, please send an email to the email shown on the screen. We try to keep our emails down to a reasonable number each month, mostly meeting reminders. And now some announcements. As far as announcements, I don't really have any. Just keep an eye on the south, our, on our website's um, Southeast Michigan Genealogy Calendar so you can see what else is going on in the area. Um, this is our last official meeting for the season. And um, we'll pick up again in September. Um, please email me if you are interested in doing something over the summer, like a help session or anything like that. And we will think about uh, maybe having one or two of those, just so we can keep in touch and no one feels abandoned. <laughs> because uh, it's, it's going to be a little while for the libraries to open, I think. So with that, Welcome to the Macomb County Genealogy Group's uh, combined virtual meeting of our Friday group and our Wednesday night Let's Talk Genealogy discussion group. Tonight's speaker is our own Robert McGarry. He is presenting on new AI tools for organizing digital photos. So he wanted to present it in our Let's Talk Genealogy discussion format. So I believe it's gonna be a little bit interactive um, so I hope you brought your ideas and your questions and a desire to learn. So if you haven't already muted your camera, please do so. Mute, mute your, shut off your camera <laughs> and mute yourself. We'll get started. So Bob has, by the way, is our vice chairperson. And he has um, helped people out with questions during meetings um, and technical advice uh, and how to do things with their genealogy or their computer. Um, he's got some photography skills uh, among some woodworking <laughs> skills that he uses for professions. So with that, Bob, We'll get muted here and the camera's off and you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. Um, new AI tools for, for organizing digital photos. Um, 
What is AI? AI stands for artificial intelligence. It basically is machines are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. It includes traits such as learning and problem solving. And lately this has become a big, the ability for machines to actually do this has become a big boom in um, photo editing and photo organization for, for one major reason. And that's pretty much everybody carries a smartphone nowadays. Um, those smartphones all have cameras. People always have a camera with them. They're taking literally mil millions of pictures every day uh, that they're sharing out, possibly sharing out on social media. And then they go into their camera roll and most people have thousands of images, hundreds to thousands of images on their, on their phone's camera roll and they can't find any of them. Uh, consequently, that creates an issue and there's people putting tools together to help them out as well as a lot of things in photo editing are very difficult and require a lot of education or learning how to use the programs well they're creating ai tools that can make or do some of the heavy lifting on photo editing to bring it down so you don't need as much education for editing so we'll talk about organizing, but certainly anything when we get to the Q&A on digital photos is, is on the table and I will try my best to answer it. Um, I will organize my photos when I get around to it. Most of us have both a hot mess in our, in our camera rolls on our phones. We also have our shoebox of photos someplace. And for the most part, most of us uh, it's taking a backseat to our genealogy, but in the case of the photos in our in our shoebox, those are important to our family history work that we've already done. And certainly, as we're taking photos with our phones and our and possibly our digital cameras, we're recording family history as it goes. And unfortunately, a lot of them are totally disorganized and could be lost in the process. The keys for photo organization. When I'm looking for a photo, I know one of these four pieces of information. I know about when the photo was taken. I may know where the photo was taken. I may know who is in the photo or I'm looking for a, specific, a photo of a specific person. I also may know what is in the photo. And fortunately, a lot of, this, a lot of the solutions that are out there are helping us find those, um, that information quickly. Certainly where is helpful with, with smartphone photos because most smartphones have GPS. And when you take a photo with your phone, it records where that photo was taken into the photo and can be searched for that way. When all digital photos are time stamped by the camera, and certainly that is changeable because back in the early days of digital photography, it was, it was very common for people to forget to set the clock now the clocks are pretty pretty well stay up to date and certainly with your phones they uh they stay exactly up to date so we know when who is in the photo an ai technology called facial recognition can help us with that and i'll show you how some of that works and what is in the photo now we have when we're when we're putting photos online at various sites they're actually examining our photos creating what's in the photo so we can actually do a text search for specific items so that's it for the, the PowerPoint slides. I'm going to go to a couple of demonstrations. Um, I'm going to open up a photo library I put together for this demonstration purpose, which is a hot mess. Um, I have 651 photos. It's a combination of digital photos I took with a digital camera, with my phone, and, uh, and scans. Um, now, if you notice, everything is organized chronologically. So the most recent photos in here are Beverly Bishop presenting on um, World War One and beyond, which I took with my digital camera. And then we've got Bob, some of the Christmas parties. We're, Bob, we're just yes. seeing the, the uh, PowerPoint. You need to swipe oh. forward to exit so we can okay. see what you're talking about. All right. Whoops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I got too many windows open. <laughs> 
and share that. Okay, there's my Lightroom window. There we go. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> um, and while I've got this open, I'm going to go ahead and close the PowerPoint since we're done with that. So I don't open that. Um, so should have the Lightroom window back up. Um, so if I want to search this particular collection, and like I said, this is a hot mess. There's no, there's no metadata recorded. Um, I've even got some critter photos in there that I forgot to take out, uh, but it's uh, some of my some of my work photos um, and a bunch of scans. I can actually I can actually get a breakdown by date. So 2019 was when Beverly presented. So that's where I have those photos. But where I've added dates, I can go back all the way to 1893, where I've recorded the date of my grandmother's picture, which is in this collection and that was from a, obviously from a scan from a um, from a cabinet card so we can certainly in a digital so digital um, environment help to organize this way and it tells me how many photos is in this collection by year so that gives me an idea to search by date or time but now if i go to people even though I've got nobody labeled, it's used facial recognition and scanned faces. And I've got a I've got pictures of everybody. I can go in and tag who I want to tag uh, with with their names as appropriate. You can see because of the wide variety of pictures I've taken between my in this collection between my scans and what I've taken at the genealogy group functions. We've, I've got quite a few people in here, and again, nobody's tagged out as of yet. Uh, but I can also go in, I'm going to go back to all photos, and I can do a search. Go back up to the top. Scroll back up to the top. Takes a minute to go through 100, 651 photos, and I can do a search. Somebody added. Let's go by date. Where is my search box? Of course, when we're live, it's when we forget where we where things are. Oh, uh, it's at the top center. Top center. Okay, it's my my thing is covering it. We'll do it this Control way, F. search my photos, there we go. So if I say I'm looking for a photo that has a cart in it, I can type the word cart. And it brings up two photos with carts. One happened to be a photo of my wife's mother that was taken in a goat cart. Um, and again, there's nothing, there's nothing there other than my photos were scanned. Now, if I wanna find a boat, We'll type boat and we've got four pictures in a boat um the two pictures right next to each other on the left the first one is the original scan and the second one was ai colorized using uh photoshop elements so that's another trick with ai um of course sometimes i'm going to zoom in on that photo um the coloring isn't quite right when ai does it I don't think Charlie was wearing wearing red pants. He was probably dark gray. Uh, so that's some of the features. Now this is Lightroom. This is a this is a paid subscription program, um, and the photos are in this case are st are stored online. Um, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna minimize that. I'm gonna stop my share and reshare a different screen. For, because if you don't want to go that route, um, those of you who have Windows have something called Microsoft Photo. It's part of Windows 10. It has been improved very greatly. And again, now this is showing June 2021 because a lot of these photos, when they when I uploaded them into this collection, didn't have dates. But the ones that did, like I can go back to the 1893 photo. And we have the same photo. 
It also gives us the ability to create, it, it uses some AI to create albums. Since these photos were geocoded, it says it, it created an album called Friday Afternoon in Mount Clemens. And it did that automatically for us um, Friday, December 11th, 2015, which was one of our Christmas parties. Uh, it did that automatically. And again, we do have the people view so we can start tagging. Unfortunately, Microsoft Photos does not do the, um, do the text search where it goes in and looks at your, um, at your library for things as of yet. But because um, Adobe Lightroom does it and Google Photos, which I'm going to show you next, does it, uh, it will, um, it does work on that. So now I'm going to stop the share and we're going to go to Google Photos. Actually, I'm going to share, but I'm going to come up in Google Drive, but I'm going to switch over to Photos. And this is Google Photos. Uh, if you have an Android phone, Google Photos is built right into your phone and you can work with it that way. Um, again, we have the same. If I go to a search, it does it does a facial recognition and and my untagged people are going to show up as faces, and I can search for boat, and it's going to bring up the set. It's going to bring up. Actually, it did a better job and found more photos than uh, than Lightroom, um, and it also will. Um, it doesn't do as it doesn't do as much on dates as Lightroom and and Microsoft, but it is a way to uh, to store all your photos. Um, so that's basically organiza organizational tools that then you can use. Um, in all of these, we can actually begin to tag metadata. And again, it's recognizing that this, this and, the, and it did get it right. This is, that's my grandfather. That's my grandfather with, I think, my great grandfather. It got it right. I can add a location. Um, I uploaded this demo collection yesterday, and I can also do, I can mark it as a favorite. Um, there's my info. I can add a description, which which is recommended, and uh, go ahead and edit this this photo quite a bit. So that's basically organizational tools. Google Photos does have a charge. It, um, it's in the, it's in your handout what they do charge. The you share your your first fifteen um, fifteen megabytes with with all of the rest of your Google, and then you start uh, you start they start charging you. Um, let me and again that same Lightroom collection that was available in the Lightroom app I can also access from web browser. So if I'm not on my computer or on my phone. I still can access my photos. I don't have all of the tools that I would have, but I can access it from a web browser. Uh, let me pull this back. I'm going to show you one other thing on Google that I alluded to. Another AI tool on Google is um, but it's not on Google Photos, it's on Google Drive is OCR. You can OCR a photo on um, Google. So as part of my demonstration, I uploaded this piece of loose paper from a probate in one of my um, one of my genealogy uh, files. And if I open this with handwriting, there's the now it didn't do a great job on the handwriting, but it's improving. Um, I've, I've gotten them where they're pretty well right on. One of the ones I did for the, um, let me close that. One of the ones I did for um, last week, last month's presentation. Um, George Priest a bit, it pretty well got it right on. 
And with a few small changes, I was able to take that and post the entire um, information into my um, genealogy program as a, as a transcription. Uh, it did a pretty good job of that. So that's, bring that down again. Um, also, there's Amazon photos out there. Um, I did put the collection up on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, you have unlimited storage for photos for backup purposes. So you can store your originals to Amazon um, for free. But it doesn't, it, other than chronologically, where it figure, finds the dates, it doesn't really have the search features that some of the other um, ones have. But I did run the collection up at, Am up at Amazon to do part of the demo. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen on that. And I'm gonna show you something else that just was released by Adobe today. And that is, a. a an object called re, it basically resizes or doubles the size of your photo using AI. So in this case, this is a digital photo I took way back in 11.22 of 21 with my first digital camera. You can see the file size is 2000 or the, the pixel size is 2048 by 1580 36. And let's say I wanna make a big print out of this. Um, I can enhance this, which gives me what we call super resolution. Super resolution is the new is the new tool, and it's in Lightroom. It's in the Lightroom on the um, on the web as well. It's just you need the original photo, which is on my hard drive. So I've got it in a in a different version of Lightroom. But it's going to tell me it's going to enhance this in nine seconds. And that's what that super enhanced um, of the Mount Clemens Fire Department logo is going to look like when I'm done. I'm going to click enhance and it's creating the enhanced. And two operations in progress. And we've now doubled that photo in size. We're now 4,096 by 3072. Um, so if I want to make a print out of that, I'm going to get my calculator, 72 divided by 300. So I can make probably a 10 inch print on the narrow side out of that, which I couldn't do before with and, and still have good resolution. So it's there if we zoom in to 100%. You can see how much detail it preserved, which usually we don't get that kind of detail preserved when we do a, when we do an upsize like that. So for older digital photos or maybe older smartphone photos, um, we can now increase in, enhance um, where we're at. Plus, it creates a digital negative, so we can edit it a little bit easier in uh, in a parametric editor. Um, so I'm going to stop my share. I'm going to turn my video back on. And I'm going to look at the chat. I forgot to unmute myself. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. I'm reading through the chat. From uh, at 719, uh, from Christopher Werner. Okay. Uh, Bob, do you know what version of Lightroom added the AI features demonstrated? I have Lightroom 6.14, which is a standalone, does not require monthly fee. <laughs> yes, the um, the actual online version where they're at Lightroom since 6.41, which was a um, you bought it, you owned it uh, feature and the Creative Cloud Lightroom had actually split into two different um, programs. There's Lightroom uh, Classic, which is what I did the enhance in, um, which is, I believe, 10 something. I just got the new update this today that was released yesterday, and it's 10.2 or 10.4 something. Um, and then the online version is Lightpoint 
I think it's 4.14 or 4.13, something like that. But in order, in order to, I mean, you can, you can download the phone version, use it for free, but you don't have the, um, the ability to save files to the cloud. If you have the creative cloud subscription, the 999 a month, you can save files to the cloud. Um, you've got, I believe it's 20 gigabytes of cloud space. Now, if you're using, and it gives you both Lightroom Classic and the, 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 the Lightroom Cloud ecosystem. If you're using Lightroom Classic, what you can do is you can still store your photos on your hard drives, which is what I have, and create smart previews, which upload to the cloud. And those smart previews don't count against your, um, your, your 20 gigabytes. They also have another plan, which is $14.95 a month, which is basically the standalone Lightroom plan with the cloud version, and you get um, you get a terabyte of cloud storage. I don't okay, use. Uh, I'm just gonna. I don't care about the cloud. Mm -hmm. I'm only concerned about stuff I pay for once. So I think what you're telling me is that my six version six point version can be upgraded to version ten. Does that version ten, which you're calling classic, have the AI features that you demonstrated today? It has some of the AI features. Um, it it does have that, but it's not a it's not sold as a standalone program. It's sold as a nine ninety nine a month subscription. So I'm one hundred twenty a year, whether I like it or not. Okay, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's the unfortunate thing. Six one four um, is still serviceable for a lot of people, but for that nine ninety nine a month, you also get the full version of Photoshop CC. So some of the colorization features and whatnot and uh, sky replacement, a whole bunch of photo editing stuff is now in uh, Photoshop CC. Thank you. Um, Money, uh, Gene Peterson asked, um, when he has a minute, can he show us which of the three programs allows for efficient captioning of photos right on the pick? The MS one is clumsy how good is google and lightroom i would use this to caption a series of photos from a vacation okay captioning captioning's kind of funky because i know a lot of people like to do um um captioning right on the picture and print it out unfortunately that's not a big feature for a lot of programs um and light, in fact, a lot of people bash on Lightroom because Lightroom doesn't, it's, it's very hard to create a, a, a caption print in the print module in Lightroom. Um, one thing that I would recommend if you're going to do that type of captioning, I would probably use a photo editor like um, either InfraView, which is free, um, GIMP, which is free, um, or uh, on the Adobe products, Photoshop Elements or Photoshop uh, CC to do that, uh, which is basically simply uh, we increase the canvas size and then put our caption on the canvas size and then print from there. Um, the the do you say uh, those those two again? InfoView and GIMP. Yes, yes, um, those are free. I will. Um, I will get some, I will, I'm probably going to end up putting an editor together for this. So Lisa, if you can make some notes um, and I can get some yeah. links, links out to you on, on those. Um, GIMP is basically a free version that is almost as possible, almost as powerful as Photoshop CC. The downside is because it is a huge program and has a lot to learn, um, a lot of people are intimidated by it but it runs on most, um, on most systems. It doesn't require the, the, the level of computer overhead that say running Photoshop CC does. Um, InfraView is a photo editor. I don't particularly care for it, but a lot of people do like it because it's free. And then certainly the Adobe products of, of Photoshop Elements and Photoshop uh, CC Elements. Elements is fairly reasonable. It's about Going price is about seventy nine a month, seventy nine for it. They come out with a new version every year. Usually on Black Friday, they have it for fifty nine dollars, um, and that's the that's the best time to get it. 
Um, and if you have it and haven't upgraded in a while, they've added a bunch of AI tools to make selections easier and, and the like. Um, so, and Christopher's got GIMP on there. Yeah, GIMP is, um, I've played with it a little bit. Uh, it's a little different than Photoshop. You know, it does have a bit more of a learning curve, but uh, GIMP is, um, is a free program and it comes, it's available for Windows, Mac and um, Linux. Uh, whereas Photoshop is only available for Windows and Mac. Any other questions? Not seeing any other in the chat. So if anyone else has one, they can unmute themselves and ask Bob themselves. What I can do is I can kind of, let me see if I have Infraview on here. Bob, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. This is Sharon Geyer. Hi, Sharon. Uh, I thought a few years back or so, there was a program where someone referred to a an app or whatever, where you could actually take pictures you didn't know about. Like I've got a um, an album of pictures that my aunt came into, into um, you know, contact with and she thought they probably were family friends etc but didn't know who they were mm -hmm. my impression was there was some place i might be able to post some of these mm -hmm. and get either individual or computer kinds of ids if they matched anything is that some pipe dream or was was there really well, something about that? there is there is a website called dead fred Dead Fred. Uh, Dead Fred um, that allows people to post orphan photos that they don't have a clue who they are. Um, but the reality is probably if that photo was in a, in a collection mm -hmm. uh, by someone, I consider that photo likely a member of that person's fan club, um, unless they were a famous person. Uh, because most people just didn't collect random photos. They either collected, they collected their family, friends, and neighbors, mm -hmm. or they collected famous people. Um, but uh, they didn't really collect um, random photos. Right. I would be looking, I would be looking at um, the photo detectives work who I strongly recommend if you're interested in, in uh, old, identifying older photos, um, go to her website. Whose um, website is that? Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, uh, she has a website and a Facebook page, um, and we'll get you the link for, for it. Okay. Um, she also does a, um, she also does a, a podcast and has classes into, um, into, um, on ident identifying photos, especially time period and through, through what's in the photo and fashions. Mm -hmm. Um, she does, she also does consulting work where, you know, she will do an online consult, whether you send her a digital copy of the photo and she, uh, she goes through it, but, um, I follow her, um, uh, I follow her websites and listen to her podcasts today. She was talking about how African America, or she had a guest on who was talking about how African Americans use photography during the civil war and the, and, and the reconstruction period to kind of change try to change the stereotypes of how they were depicted in art and uh, photography and there were a lot of african-american photographers and there was also a lot about people on there collecting in their albums photos of people who were famous at the time mm -hmm. um and uh especially with carte de visites which were common in the 1860s uh and were replaced by cabinet cards probably by the time um reconstruction was over oh, okay. but uh but you know the older cardboard albumen prints were were very popular and very collectible to get passed around whereas um your you know your your tin types your your precursor your daguerreotypes those were all one of photos but when they started to make the um the albumen prints on cardboard they could make um multiples of the same picture mm -hmm. and those were the first actual passable pass around photos mm -hmm. so okay so you could get me contact information yes great yes. thank you we will do that i have a question sure i'm gene peterson i Hi, um Jean. 
in terms of photo ed editors, do you have anything positive or negative to say about Picasso? Uh, Pica other than Google no longer supports Picasso. Um, mm. It was a great tool when it was when it was out, but Google kind of stopped support for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's there's some copies floating around. If you if you want to if you want to reinstall it on a on a Windows computer, yeah. you can probably pull it off. It it did a heck of a lot, but basically Google Photos has has replaced Picasso in the it. Google okay. environment. <laughs> okay, got it. Thanks. <laughs> So, and there was uh, one more in the chat, I think. When oh, it you just came in. Yeah. Okay. So it says, um, when you scan old photos from your collection, what do you have to do to get it to an earlier, more original date instead of the date you scan the photos? Okay. Well, let me uh, show you how to do that. I will, I will share my screen again. And... I'm going to go to the. Um... I've been trying to put links in the chat for everyone um, for things that are mentioned. And I, besides Dead Fred, I did add the link to get to Photoshop Elements on Adobe because if you go to the mm -hmm. products, it's kind of hidden. But um, so that link will take you to the Photoshop Elements page. And Photoshop Elements comes with um, Organizer, and it has a facial recognition feature, similar to other organizing uh, programs for now, photos. I'm going to show you in Lightroom, but it pretty much photos um, are different. This one, we, we did the scan on March 17th of 2005. But what I can do is I can click on the, on the edit, um, which is that little pencil there. And since I don't know the I don't know the exact date, but I'm going to just pick a summer month. Um, I'm just not going to change the date. And from the picture, I'm going to say this was 19. Got to move over one more. Oh. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. One nine five seven, and change done. Now it's going to sort to that date. So if I go back to, um, let me close out of the info and go back to all photos. Uh, let me clear the, the search and go back to all photos and bring back my timeline um, and go by date. If I go back to 1957, that photo is there. So that, and every program, you should be able to pull up that info, click on that date, and there should be a mechanism to change it depending on which program you're using. Each one's just a little different, but um, <laughs> that's how you, uh, you, you change your, your date. Um, and like I said, this, the only reason I, I took a bunch of photos that were that I knew were going to be a hot mess that I didn't change the dates to to show you on demonstration. Bob, I have another question. Sure. Uh, sorry, I tried to do it on chat and I kept running into problems. Not uh, a problem. I have a lot of my photos attached to family members on Ancestry. Okay. I am getting notices from Ancestry DNA that they've identified possible matches. And a lot of them are my own pictures. So that's irritating. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time, I can't open them up. They just bring me in to how to sign up for membership. Well, I've got all the memberships. So that's not only ineffective and irritating, but it's keeping me from seeing some of the things that aren't mine, you know, like census or other things. Is anybody else running into that problem? Am I doing something wrong? Well, it almost sounds like when you're coming into Ancestry, you're not automatically logged in. Um, it's just, this is just on my email. Right. Well, if you come in, the two problems. Ancestry is, poor, other than, yes, I want to stick a photo on my, on my, uh, on my tr online tree, mm -hmm. Ancestry is probably not the best place for historical photos to begin with. 
and secondly, um, you know, I kind of take most of Ancestry's emails with a grain of salt. Uh, but I paid know. for that DNA. Well, I know you paid for the DNA, but the, and and if I've got a DNA match, yeah, I'm going to go look at it. But I'm gonna I'm not going to go from the link in the email. I'm gonna I'm gonna log into my account and go into um, go into DNA or go into my tree. But keep in mind, your photos are attached to your to your online tree, so it's mm -hmm. got to work off of your. Um, off of your account. So if I get if I get an email that says you've got a I've got a DNA match, I go into I go directly into Ancestry DNA. I've created a link for it in my web browser, and I don't even go from the link in the email. I just I just go right to it, and my mine is set up so I stay logged in all the time, so I can very quickly get to where I need to want to get. And then I can look not only at the match they're telling me, hey, you got this new match, but I can look for any new matches in my DNA. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so. I have a, may I, ex may I piggyback on Sharon's question? Sure. Would you expand a little bit on your reasoning that an, uh, Ancestry isn't the best place for your historical photos? And well, does that also go for Family Tree Maker? Well, again, with Family Tree Maker, you can you can you can create your library of photos. When you're when you're uploading and downloading tree information in Family Tree Maker, of course, I don't use that as my genealogy program. I use Rich Magic, but um, you can decide whether you want that photo to upload or not. Um, the problem I have with Ancestry is there's very little control about you know, they, they like to pass the photos around a little bit and they don't include the stuff you can, basically there's part of a digital photo called metadata. And um, metadata is information about the photo. You know, who took the picture, who's in the picture, the caption, um, any keywords you might have, uh, the dates, which when we changed the date, we were changing the date in metadata. Um, Ancestry really ignores it and kind of takes it out, uh, which is a problem. Uh, there is a there is a group working on gene you know standards for genealogical metadata, um, and hopefully Ancestry because they, they've published the the first set of standards. Hopefully Ancestry at some point gets on board, and I'm going to change my position on putting photos on Ancestry. But right now, the only major photo site where you can attach photos to a genealogical tree that's on board with this is Family Search. Um, Family Search has been part of that group from the beginning, and Family Search is going to be probably be the first site to implement it on their um, universal tree. Uh, so if you've posted the photo, you can put the metadata information plus the the caption of who posted that photo comes back to your family search account. Um, so I put minimal, personally, I put minimal photos in Ancestry, um, even though I do have online trees. But that's just my opinion with that. Good. Thank you very much for that information. Ancestry so also, I'll jump in here for a moment to add. Sure. Ancestry also has size limitations. So um, you can't upload extremely large files. And if you do, it will um, reduce the resolute or the size of the file, which may reduce the quality of the photograph as it's doing that reduction. So that's one thing. And um, Ancestry does in most cases say who originally posted the photo if the person has just um, copied it straight from the original ancestor tree to theirs or linked or you know that kind of thing but if they've downloaded it and then re-uploaded it it's going to look like that person is the originator of the file so there's the little conflict of problem there for some people um my heritage um, doesn't right now um, indicate who is the original uploader of a photograph. Um, they're aware that um, members would like that to happen like it does on Ancestry, 
um, but it's something they, they've got to work on to figure out how to implement. And with Family Tree Maker, the photos don't go into Family Tree Maker. They just link to whichever drive you have it on your computer, the, you know, the photo images or the document images. And then you decide whether you want to upload them if your tree is synced to an Ancestry online tree. You decide if you want them to be able to upload it. If you don't want it to upload to your online tree, then you mark it as private and it will not upload. And again, you've got to remember the size limitation of the photos so that you don't have any um, problems when you're doing your syncing. Okay. Thank right, you, Lisa. Thank, yeah, thanks, you're Lisa. I, for, I forgot about that. One important, no, and Lisa brought up an important point. And this is another reason, again, like I said, I don't upload photos to Ancestry re re regularly. But when I do upload photos to social media, say Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, I always do the resize of that photo to meet their specifications before I upload it, because what typically happens in that upload process when they, if I upload something too big, they're going to crunch that photo down and it ends up looking usually terrible, um, or at least not like I intended it to look. So because they've published their sizes, I can resize that photo in my software before I upload it. And that solves a lot of the upload problems. Unfortunately, Ancestry says, we're going to reduce your photo size, but they don't tell us how. Mm -hmm. And uh, with thousands of people uploading photos, that takes a lot of space. And that brings us into the next question from the chat. In past presentations, we were told some cloud storage limited the size you could retrieve in your photos back. Have things improved? Or are there better places to store in the cloud? The answer to that is yes, things have improved. If you like, Google Photos for years, and in fact, of June 1st, they stopped it. If you, if you uploaded at what they called high resolution, you could upload an unlimited number of files for free. Now, if you took advantage of that up until June 1st, those files on Google are still free. They're not counting against your, uh, against your 15 gigabytes of storage in all of Google. Um, and if you go over that, you've got to pay for more storage. Most sites where you're paying something for storage, you can you can upload at full resolution. Um, and by paying, you're either paying a subscription fee, um, which with iCloud photos, you would uh, after five gigabytes with Amazon or with Google, you would pay after um, after 15 gigabytes. Again, that's not just photos, but that's your, your Gmail account and anything in your Google Drive as well. Um, with Lightroom, you know, I talked about some of their pricing. Uh, Amazon Photos, if you have a Prime account, you can upload original photos at original resolution with an unlimited number, but that's part of their Prime subscription. If you just get, a, if you're just using a free Amazon account like I am for this demo, I've got five gigabytes, which is not a lot of resolution to store full resolution photos, especially since some of our digital cameras now um, are creating very, very big photos, especially raw photos. Um, I go out with my digital camera, I shoot um, a couple hundred pictures, and I've got about four gigabytes of data just in that couple hundred pictures uh, at, at raw. So yes, and there are places I could upload them to the web. Really, what I do is I keep them on my on, on a local two two terabyte hard drive that backs up to my online backup storage, where I have I think five terabytes of uh, of available storage, and I also have a, another backup drive, which is like an eight terabyte drive that everything in my systems back up to. So I have it in three locations very rapidly. It happens automatically once I once I download a card card from my photos or if I'm taking photos with my phone, um, it uploads to the Lightroom ecosystem, comes back down to my computer and uh, ends up in my backup system automatically. So I don't have to think about it. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Any other questions? Okay, I have a share. Okay. And um, I don't know if you wanna do this, uh, you share your, or, or here, I'll do it. You do it. Okay. Let me bring this down and then flip back over to that. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. 
uh, where to go? Yesterday, Family Tree webinars, they had a presentation on new breakthroughs in MyHeritage's photos tools. And this is free to watch until next Monday, Tuesday, somewhere in there. Uh, it's an hour and 29 minutes, and it talks about their photo um, feature, the nostalgia, which uh, animates a photograph, and they've got some image editing and enhancing features. Um, they have a feature that will double the resolution of photographs up, uploaded. Now, to really take advantage of this, you have to have a data subscription, but you can do two or three or a few photographs um, for free. But to see what it can do for you, especially if you already have a MyHeritage data subscription, um, you can watch this video for free. Anyone can watch it and see what this technology can do. And it's kind of interesting. So that, that's my share. Thank you, because I, for, I forgot to mention those. I also forgot to mention one program that, again, uses AI, um, and it's, it's great for enhancing photos and doing um, some metadata entry, especially for scanned photos. It saves you from having to have Photoshop. So I'm going to share my screen, if I can find it. And it's called Restore by Vivapix. Now, what Restore does is, it one, it allows you it interesting story on Restore. Originally, the people that created this program created it, first created a program, the Vivapix folks, for um, removing the off-color from photos that were taken underwater. So they found out very quickly that this could also work, and some of their AI could work to deal with faded and off-color photos from scans. And then they then they got involved with the genealogy community, and they're very heavily involved with the genealogy community. So they've added some features that are really, really helpful for this for, for doing family history work. So I'll give you a quick demonstration of it. Um, we'll start with a faded, a badly off-color slide. I'm going to open this up, and it's going to do its magic. And it's going to take a second because I've got too many windows open and uh, I'm streaming stuff, but it should come up with a, um, a nine up view of the restored photo in just a second. Anytime now. Mm -hmm. And while we're waiting on this, I'll answer Beverly Bishop's question on DNA kits on sale. I just got an email from Ancestry today. They're, they're, they're doing uh, $59 uh, for Father's Day. Okay, I there we go. I was typing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just about all of the um, DNA uh, company, testing companies will have sales for Father's Day. Um, just kind of go, go to the site um, and see if it appears already. Um, I, while Bob shows this, I'll poke around and um, see which ones already have their sales going. Okay, so from the badly faded or from the faded printer slide, which this is a faded, this is a scan of a slide. Um, it was faded. I'm probably going to pick the one in the middle. Um, but let's try badly, which that's still showing off color. So we're just going to do the faded printer slide. Um, so that's the original. That's how bad off, badly off color it was. That's the processed, and that's the two side by side. Now I can go in here, and I can uh, do a detailed edit. So I can change the color balance a little bit if I want to. I can uh, bring up the vividness. I can add a little bit of sharpening, which I like to do. I'll pull the colors up a little bit because those skin tones look just a touch washed out. And that warms things up a bit. Um, and now 
I can um, I can save this since I started with a TIFF file. It'll give me a TIFF, a full resolution JPEG, and a and a uh, email size JPEG. Um, and I can go in to um, save that. So for the next one, it's gonna it's gonna take a second to save that out. And then I'm going to bring up one which is a um, a handwritten digital image of a um, probate scan that was very very poor, and we'll show you how you can in enhance a record and then actually go over to a screen and um, and literally type it yourself if um, if you can't make it readable um, for OCR. So. Um, while this is while we're waiting on this, interested in inserting photos into oral histories captured on Zoom. And Beverly, I saw your question on. If you're going to put it in the transcription, I'll show you how to do that in Microsoft Word in a minute. Um, For the question about DNA, while well, we're still cooking here. Okay. Uh, my heritage DNA is, uh, their autosomal test is uh, currently on sale for $59. It's regularly $79. And of course, um, you know, there's shipping involved, involved there unless you buy two or more kits. It says free shipping. And the sale ends in 11 days. Um, 23andMe, which is buy $50 off when you buy one Health Plus Ancestry kit. Um, and so that would be $149 instead of $199. Now they do still have just the plain Ancestry and Traits service, which is regularly $99 on sale for $79, but they've limited your matches to the first, I think, $1,500. Um, so it works, but you got to realize they've also started limiting some of what you're getting. Um, and if you buy a second kit at the same time for the Health Plus Ancestry, Instead of that second kit being $199, it's only $99. Um, or there is, you get the window up, pop up window out of the way. If you're just buying a 23andMe um, Health Plus Ancestry service one kit um, you, and you buy the membership, then you get access for $29 a year, you get access to all of your matches and some additional tools. So um, check the, just go to 23andMe.com and you can check out on their main homepage what that is. Um, Ancestry DNA for their autosomal, which is the origins and ethnicity and DNA matches. It's on sale for $59 instead of $99. Um, there's a couple other variations, the DNA kit. Um, origins, ethnicity, DNA matches, um, and a three-month World Explorer membership for $60, which would have been regularly $178. Or there's the or DNA kit, the origins, ethnicity, DNA matches, and then the extra personal traits, which is kind of nice to know, but not need to know, um, for $69, which would have been regularly $119. These are all going to be on their home pages. Um, Family Tree DNA has not started their Father's Day sale yet. So just go to their site and check to see when their sale starts. Um, Living DNA doesn't look like um, they have a sale. Oh wait, nope, they said Father's Day sale up to 20% off and free shipping on three kids. Now Living DNA is a smaller company it's based in the UK, so if you have a lot of English ancestry, they are trying to get down to by a, a county um, look at um, where your ancestry comes from. So that's 
something to keep in mind. They also take uploads. Um, I believe it looks like it's on sale for there's different levels of kits and some of it is more health, um, you know, vitamin things like that. Um, so the basic one is 99. This is for the ancestry, the equivalent of the normal test. Uh, it's really 99. It's on sale for 79 plus shipping. So just go check out sites and I'll try to pull together a post for our blog. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. So I've got the next one up and I'm selecting faded document or text because that's what this is. It's a scan of a very faded document. Uh, I think the first one up in the upper left is the best. So we're going to select that and we can see how much um, let me um, go to the original and it's um, fortunately it doesn't let me zoom in on it. So you really can't tell, but if we go to the processed one, we can see some writing. And when we go to both now, I'm going to zoom in. Um, and this is the tra zoom transcribe. So I can actually go zoom in to a hundred percent. And now I can actually come in here. Um, and start transcribing. And then when I click save, it's going to put that in the metadata of the, um, of the image. So and I'm not going to wait for this to save out. It will. Uh, so this Vivipix is available for $49.95, um, and it resides on your system. I think it's a great program. Um, anybody who's doing scans probably should get this. I would recommend it unless you're really trained and want to do a lot of um, photo re reconstruction on yourself. Um, by yourself, I would recommend this over go, going into Photoshop or Photoshop Elements. Um, in fact, that original slide, uh, it did a better job taking care of the color shift than I was able to do in, um, in Photoshop CC a few years ago. It, it actually was quicker and easier and um, in seconds, um, which is it didn't seem like seconds because I got too many windows open right now, but on my, on my system where it was the only thing running in seconds was able to do um, what it does. So um, that's how this pro this, that's this program working. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, Christopher says this would be great for deed research. I concur. Um, that particular uh, probate, was something uh, one of our members asked me to try to fix many years ago. And I tried and tried and tried in Photoshop and I couldn't really make heads or tails out of it. And uh, when they brought out the feature for uh, document fix, I threw through that particular thing at this at uh, Vivapix and it cleared it right up. Um, so uh, my, I, mean, I mean, I may have the best Photoshop skills in the world, but I'm pretty good with the program. And I tried everything in that you know, cleared it quickly. So any other questions? Put them in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask away. Yes, please do. Has anybody tried um, the coloring photos at my heritage or any place else? Haven't yet. I'm getting oh. tempted. <laughs> No, I, I, but I, I see it done all the time on Facebook, all the genealogy pages. People put up a picture and the next thing you know, somebody has colorized it mm -hmm. in the comments and it looks real nice. It's, they're just doing it constantly. Yeah, it's, um, it is definitely a way to enhance things. Uh, my experience with AI colorization is it isn't perfect, um, but considering the amount of work it takes to colorize a picture, by hand, um, doing it the old fashioned way. Um, it's, it's a lot easier. Plus I look at it, uh, when Adobe came out with it in Photoshop elements, uh, last year, 20, well, end of 2019, 
20, it was the 2020 version of Photoshop Elements. Um, I bought it and looked at it as it gives me a starting point if I'm doing manual colorization work, at least it's going to do some of the lifting for me. And um, I've gotten halfway decent results, but it's not, uh, it's not perfect. Sharon had a, okay. any other questions? Anyone have a favorite uh, program that they like to use? This is the share part of Let's Talk. Yes. Everybody got their 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 shoebox of photo scan. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was fortunate enough to find in the box one of the boxes of photos. One of my husband's uh, great aunts wrote right on the pictures. He she wrote the names of the people, mm -hmm. and just in in ink pen, and it's such a godsend. If you look at him like, why you, but bless you. <laughs> no, I know who it exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah, if you if you if you actually want to write on your photos and one good little tip to uh, when you're scanning your photos, go to the art supply store and get yourself a 6B or an 8B pencil and get yourself a zig marker. The 8B pencil will you can when you when you've completed it, make a little dot on the back that indicates it was scanned with the 8B pencil. If it's if it's paper paper, if the paper has a plasticky feel for it to it, the, the 8B pencil is not going to work. Use the zig marker, but both of those are soft enough that they're not going to damage the photo when you um, when you write on it. I think Christopher has his hand up. <laughs> uh, yeah, you were asking about uh, favorite software. Um, I do a bunch of architectural photography too, as we're working around the area. I know it doesn't mean to do with genealogy, but uh, DxO has uh, some products that um, allow you to correct uh, distortion. Um, the, the typical thing you get with a camera, if you're taking a picture of a very tall building where your uh, <laughs> parallax tends to make things turn small at the top, a little, instead of the fancy cameras we used to have with the, uh, um, of ability to have the outer lens different than where your camera is, this will correct the uh, distortion in the camera. So if you've got pictures of folks that you're restoring and you also want to make sure that they're horizontal level square and the, 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 the actual houses that they're standing in front of are the way they really were, it's a, it's a handy tool. And that it also goes on sale once a year around Black Friday. And also the, the Photoshop elements that you mentioned earlier, uh, also is available bundled with the Adobe Premiere Elements product, which will allow you to edit videos rather nicely uh, without paying the big bucks of the uh, the monthly subscription. So I think it's like 140 or something like that for the two of them together. Yeah, and that, if you so. get it on uh, Black Friday or a good sale, then it, the price of both of them, either singly or together, come down immensely. A lot of people don't are doing months. video editing, so that's why I only mentioned the Photoshop elements. Yes. Yep. Um, also, Chris, for most people, if if you know if they're using Lightroom, a lot of those tools are in Lightroom. I'm sure the stuff in DxO is probably a little bit more sophisticated, but for most of my architectural stuff, which is very little so far, I've been able to. Um, use the uprights in Lightroom. Um, yeah, and, uh, actually DxO puts out a whole set of plugins to Lightroom. Yes. <laughs> to help enhance their stuff too. It's a different part of their line, but well, if, check if, out the DxO yeah. site anyway. And yeah, if, I, if, useful. if I bought every, if I bought every plugin that, that, that people try to sell me for, for Lightroom and Photoshop, I would be broke. <laughs> so, um, yep. But, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Very nice. Oh, thank you. Any, I agree. Uh, sure. Anybody else have a question? Any questions on scanning? Scanners, those type of those problems you're having with scans? I have a non-photo question. It's sort of directed to Lisa. Would, could I pitch that in here? Sure. You can pitch that in there. Yep, I'm um, still here. Yesterday. I got a hint of a of an ancestor, and they gave me the wrong second great grandmother, 
And uh, it, this, it was from Family Search. So I'll, I'll, I'll make my question quick. I know it's the wrong one because I have the original obituaries, the copies of original obituaries for both the woman and her parents. And if I contact Family Search, am I wasting my time trying to tell them that there's that that line is incorrect, or do I uh, do, do you know if you get good results trying to um, tell them? Is there a way to reject the? Um, I haven't used Family Search, Family Tree in quite a while. Um, is there a way to reject and say, this is not this? Well, I could do that right on the face of it. I bet I could. Okay. I bet I could do it yes. right on the face of it. That would be All the it was thing. was a hint. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because if right. it's a hint, you may be able to just say, no, that's not right. Um, and, and you can provide information as to why. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. I think that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It, it could be just something left over from long ago before, you know, where uh, all the people they added were frozen and when they were trying to take care of the uh, unreasonably large uh, <laughs> uh, people, <laughs> you know, because each, each entry in the family search family tree has its own ID number and uh, in merging and merging and merging, some of these got to be really large and they couldn't do much with it until they figured things out. Um, so it could be a case of that, or it could be a case of someone made an assumption and put the wrong two people right. together. Right. Right. So, yeah. Okay. I'll I go from that. I'll go. I'll try for that. That's the most straightforward answer. I'm sorry. I'm sort of surprised I didn't think of that. Okay. You, you know, they, they change things so much here and yeah, there that's, that that's true. You, you don't remember that, oh, wait, they've added this. And it's kind of like the mm -hmm. reject a hint over at Ancestry so that you stop getting the same hint over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It was sad because it went back to my Revolutionary War Patriot. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, it's not. He's not mine. Yeah. I'm still searching for one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's there's a message from Joanne in the chat of what scanners okay. do people like? And I will definitely tackle that one. I've tackled it a little bit in the handout. If you're scanning photos, unfortunately, the heyday of scanners was about 2010. And a lot of photo scanner or a lot of manufacturers like HP, they used to make really, really good photo scanners who've kind of left the photo scanning market. They're still making scanners, but those scanners are, are aimed at scanning documents rather than photos. Uh, you can certainly use a document scanner to scan photos. However, you're going to get better results with a photo scanner. The reality is right now um, for photo scanners, about all that's out there is the Epson uh, V600 and V850. Um, the V600 is a newer newer edition of the scanner I use, which is the V550. Um, but um, the V600 is the current one. The V850 is a professional level scanner. Um, it scans a little bit faster. It'll scan bigger um, negatives uh, and, um, and scans a little bit better color grade, but it's also about $1,300. Um, the V600 will scan uh, photos, it will scan negatives, and it will scan slides, uh, both 35 millimeter and uh, 70 millimeter, uh, which is your two and a quarter um, slides. Uh, that scan, that off color scan I, I showed you was actually scanned on my V550. The advantage, one, one thing I'm going to tell people if they're going to, and another scanner that Epson makes, which I did mention in the handouts, is the Fast Photo 680. The Fast Photo 680 is a sheet fed scanner. It's designed for scanning photo paper, which most sheet fed document scanners will jam on photo paper. Um, this one will scan photo paper. It's designed to scan a bunch of photos quickly, but you want to make sure you're using modern photos. So basically anything from the um, 70s or so forward would, would scan nicely in a 680, especially if you've got a bunch of them because it, it scans in sheets. Um, if you have an older scanner that is USB, 
it probably is supported by a program called ViewScan. So even if you're upgraded to Windows 10 or one of the new Mac uh, operating systems, your scanner is still probably usable to do what it did as a photo scanner. I have a um, 20 plus year old HP for scanning four by fives um, that works just fine on ViewScan. It's a USB scanner, so it works, although my primary scanner is, uh, is my Epson V550 and it, the view scan makes my V550 um, work really well. Um, so that's kind of my take on scanners. Um, the other option obviously is camera scanning and I'm probably going to do a video on that at some point uh, in the not too distant future. I, I would uh, concur that I've used the V600 for several years and it does a fine job in low volumes. Um, the problem with any flatbed scanner is how long can your back handle a constantly flipping the door open and closed and feeding each page one at a time. And that's where you end up going to a copy stand and a camera and you just flip them in and flip them out and keep pushing the, the remote shutter button and you see everything big on a screen next to you and it goes a lot faster with a high volume. So yeah, in a small volume, if you're just talking about your family pictures, you're probably okay with a flatbed scanner. I've got a flatbed. It's a Canon, uh, Canascan. Uh, it's a 9000. Um, I like it. It's not as wonderful as my prior scanner, but that was before USB, and I really love that one. <laughs> Obviously, it was old. <laughs> now, for those of you who are local here in the Macomb County area or even nearby counties, once the library reopens, um, they have, of course, remember the book scan station, which has attached to it a flatbed scanner that is 11 by 17 inches um, big on the platen. So you can do large documents, you can do small, small documents, you can batch scan, and it scans at 300, 600, no, 200, 300, and 600 uh, PPI. So you bring in your USB drive and save it to the USB drive as a JPEG for, and then when you get home, change it to a TIFF. Um, if you're gonna do TIFFs, you gotta do them each individually, cancel out of the program and start over. Otherwise they all end up in the same TIFF file. I don't know how to get them out. <laughs> so yeah. you, you see multiple in one. It also does, um, searchable PDF file. So if you have documents, you can scan them on the flatbed or there's also a document feeder. You can put about 10 pages at a time in it and scan your documents, single page, single page or double-sided double, double -sided page. Um, so once they get that reconnected, um, once they are open and we can go in for longer than 15 minutes, um, then um, we'll have access to that again. And it's a great feature. We used it for our very first church book scanning project. So there are options and it's free. Yes. Okay, Th thank you all. Anybody else have any questions, shares? Revelations? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we're doing a let's talk, uh, any other genealogy mm -hmm. questions? <laughs> or genealogy shares. Yep. I have a question. <clears throat> I run across an obituary of one of my great grandfathers, one of my great great greats, <clears throat> and it mentions that his, fa that his father was born in Georgia, which we knew, and his grandfather was born in Maryland. Well, all of our research has been in the South. And so I've never done any research in Maryland or any place up there. Where would you start? What's the time frame you're dealing with? Okay, um, I'm thinking, it would have to, he would have, let's see. The, the, the obituary that I have was from 1911 and he was 86 years old. 
So we're talking about his grandfather. Okay, so we're in the 1700s? I think, yeah. Uh -huh. And no. do you have the grandfather in Georgia? I believe we have it in some of our records. I don't have that in front of me, but I, uh, I'm i pretty sure we, we do. Okay. I, would uh, start I, I don't know as far as having the grandfather's actual um, details, you know, birth, birth year and everything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think just census maybe, you know. Okay, but for, if you've got a census, you might be able to narrow down to an age range birth range, depending on the census? You know, well, the tick mark well, is usually be, an age it, it range. Would be, yeah, the census would be early 1800s. Okay. From Georgia. Uh -huh. Okay. But you, the tick mark would say he's between 60 and 70 or 40 and 50. Oh, I see what or, you mean. You know, yeah. so you got, you, got an, uh, you got an idea of, okay, he was at least this, if not older. Yeah. So, so that, this would... that gets you started in that bracket. And then if you yeah. can narrow down when he drops off the census, you've got an idea of an end of life. <laughs> well, this would be, but it would be this, but it would be his father. This, like the one that's in Georgia would be, um, would be his, would be his father would be yeah but we're talking but then his that's father I was asking would be the if one the, for, if the yeah. if you have the grandfather in Georgia also you know did both did just oh no the oh no 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 I don't okay. I, I don't think the I don't think the one from Maryland ever ever went to Georgia no okay all no. right I I'm pretty sure not okay start with the census narrow down when the father got to Georgia then look at land records because sometimes an early land record when they're first buying the land or get it receiving the land will indicate where he was not always but probable yeah. and then um you know it's kind of like we say we start with yourself and work back so you're going to start with that Right. father learn everything you can from him what answers he gives on his census is and then using the information you know about him if he's born in maryland to also then use that information to try well to the obituary him. no the obituary says that he was born in georgia the one okay in, then the grandfather oh, has the to grandfather, be in georgia then the grandfather if the obituary is correct. If the obituary is correct and father's born in Georgia, then grandpa's got to be there more than likely. Or at least grandma. <laughs> so then, yeah. So you need to try to figure out who, you know, where grandpa is in Georgia and scour the Georgia yeah. for details the, on the him Georgia, in order to get Georgia clues right. of where he came from in Maryland, the if that's Georgia where he right. came from. The Georgia records are such, are they're so difficult. <laughs> but um, yeah, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Do your due diligence on each generation back. Yeah, when I had looked before, we couldn't find, I think the, the last name um, is, was, was part of the problem. I think it changed. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be open-minded about spelling. Yeah, because we're looking for Marchman and I don't think we could find it when it went back to back further. And it, the only thing we could find was March meant, but that's a possibility. Oh yeah. And if you were looking before journey. all the digitized records, you really need to repeat and look at what you've done and see if there's more you can access now than you could before well, all the this is true because it's been digitization. quite a, it's been a while since we looked for that one and of course all my records on that family are are down in my basement right now and i had a flood in the basement a couple months ago and i can't get to any of that stuff because it's oh not fixed well i everything was okay i had it in in uh, 
you know, plastic boxes and everything. Good job. Good it's job. Just, yes. Yeah. It's just that uh, everything is, I just can't get to it the way it's, it hasn't yeah. been yeah. fixed. And uh, yeah. So, but but I you can went. poke around and try to <coughs> see what you can see digi digitally. And then That's when you can get to those documents, confirm, yeah. did I find the digital version? Did I find something new? Yeah, sometimes it's better to have a fresh set of eyes. Look exactly, at it's kind of like a anyway. Thomas McKinty's genealogy do-over. Yeah, right, just, exactly. Just start that line again <laughs> with a fresh eye. Yeah, yeah. In fact, and you I know, think... a lot of times it goes faster now than it did for all this digital stuff. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it's hard to work. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when we first got the computers way back when, and and we were so excited when we when we had the World Wide Web and we thought, boy, we're gonna have do our genealogy and not have any paper anymore. <laughs> I, I don't know anybody that's gotten rid of the paper. I miss Gopher. <laughs> kind of like my paper as backup. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause I, I, hard drive don't don't eat your paper. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, okay, Carol, so. okay, yeah, sorry, Sandra. Um, no, I see okay. something in the chat. Uh, Carolyn, uh, yes, we are recording and we do have recordings of the prior meetings. I'm just very, very slow at editing them and getting them up. It was my goal to get at least one this weekend, but I had family in town and that was an impossible goal. So I'm now that everything's done, I should be able to concentrate and um, edit these videos and get them up there. And I will announce it on the blog. And when I got more of them ready, I'll send a reminder email. I don't think you guys should mind too much um, that, you know, they're up there now. I apologize for being slow. Um, let's see. Um, the, the videos will post to our YouTube channel. Yes. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you have the link handy, but you might want to put that in the uh, chat. Yep, just uh, a second. Let me bring it up. Okay, there we go. <laughs> it is in our chat. Yes. And if you subscribe and uh, ring the bell when you get there, you'll get notified by YouTube when we post a new video. Exactly. Um, or Lisa, Lisa's doing most of the work and hopefully I'm, I can free up some time and kind of help her out. And I'm working on a couple that will, uh, that may post there just uh, in general. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Shares? Thoughts. Thoughts. Again, send me an email at the Macomb Co. GG. Let me put that in there. And if anybody has any questions for me, put them in the, send it to the same email and Lisa will get them to me. Thanks again to both of you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Put it in the chat, uh, our main email, and you can use that for asking to be added to the email list if you're not already on our member list. Um, letting us know if you want any summer help sessions, and we'll see if we can make that happen. And then um, questions for Bob, you, I, I, will, I will forward them mm -hmm. to him. Okay, if Maybe. not, if everyone's got everything answered, um, then um, have a great summer, do some genealogy, find some finds and have fun and we'll see you in September, or maybe a little earlier if we do some help sessions. Yes. So thank you all for coming and thank you for the two thirds of you who stayed to the end. <laughs> I know there was a couple other presentations tonight, so uh, uh, some of the others uh, left to uh, join in the fun elsewhere. Yes. Well, it's been a busy week, both in genealogy and uh, photography. So um, Apple's had announcements. Adobe dropped some, a couple of things, and um, some new camera announcements came out. So it's been kind of an interesting week so far. <laughs>
and it's only Wednesday. <laughs> okay, everyone. Thank you for coming. Yes. To quote the letterman, I'll see you in September. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. It was a great uh, presentation. You're welcome. Glad you enjoyed it, Sandra. Thank you for watching. Our next meeting is scheduled for September 8th, 2021. Last but not least, MCGG extends its thanks to the Mount Clemens Public Library and its staff for hosting this Zoom meeting. Goodbye, everyone.